Okay. This is Steve Winterberg. And uh, beginning, see, end of last year, our leadership has been wrestling with how God wants this church to grow in the next 5, 10, 15 years. And we came to the realization that some of us are getting a little long in the tooth. And, uh, and, and we're not that bad, but we're just trying to be really proactive. And we realized that if this church is to con continue to help people experience God and reflect Christ in this community, we needed to really take serious the idea of developing younger leaders and raising up, let God raise up younger leaders. And so that's been a focus. And one of the things God led us to do is to look at hiring an assistant pastor who would in turn take my place. And I'm not going anywhere. I have to repeat this. I don't plan on leaving the country, you know, and I don't plan on, you know, and so, but I'm, you know, I'm just going to be around. So you're not going to get rid of me that easily. But we are looking at, you know, hiring someone as an assistant pastor to start with. And God led us to this younger man, Steve. <laughs> so and we've had, we've had many conversations with, uh, with Steve and his wife, Shelly. And we've gotten to know them. And they're kind of a really cool couple. And they come to us with a lot of giftings and experience, training, spiritual maturity that fits us very well. And so... Uh, we've given some of you an opportunity to meet them, and today we want to let him share a message from the Word of God with you, and then we have the potluck where you can get to know him even more. And so that's why Steve is here, and we're really glad, and uh, he's got a great passage of Scripture to you know, preach on. And so, Steve, let's, uh, yeah, give it to us. Thank you. It's a privilege to be here with you today. I feel far, so I'm trying to. Um, it's, a, it's a joy and privilege to be here with you today. Hey, Steve, I forgot one thing. I yes. forgot to dismiss the kids. Oh. <laughs> Children, now the high, uh, high school, middle school, you're staying here, but preschool, uh, kindergarten go here, first through fifth grade. Go, have they already left? <laughs> Ignore me. That's why, that's why we're doing this. Good job, <laughs> That's right. Well, as I was saying, it's a joy and privilege to be here with you today um, and uh, just to learn a little bit about what God has been doing here in Valley over um, the last years, years and decades and uh, what, what he is currently doing. Um, it's a privilege to be able to share with you today. I know my wife and I have really enjoyed getting to meet several of you and to connect with you and to hear a little bit about your heart as well. Um, Doug has asked me to continue in the sermon series on the book of Romans that you have been uh, working through over the last several weeks. Uh, and so today we're going to be looking at the end of Romans 8, verses 26 through 38. Um, but before I start, I'd like to go ahead and open with a word of prayer. Um, Most High God, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness. Um, we thank you that in the midst of hardship and difficulty and struggle, um, that you are with us, that as Ron shared a minute ago, that, that you are present, that you are here, that you are in our midst, and you are in the thick of our lives, that you're in the details. We pray, God, that as we reflect on your word, that you would speak to us, that you would encourage us, and that you would motivate us to be transformed by your spirit and that we would in turn be a light in a world that desperately needs hope. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In 2016, there was a Disney film that came out called Zootopia. And Zootopia is, um, all of the characters in there are animals, and they all um, speak, right? They're talking animals and have different roles. And one particular uh, character was named Judy Hopps. She's the one on the right there. Um, she's a bunny. And she came from the countryside, and she made her way to the big, glamorous, gleaming city of Zootopia. Now, it was her ambition and goal that she wanted to be a police officer, but she was this small, tiny country bunny. Uh, and so everybody made fun of her, and they ridiculed her, and they thought, there is no way that you as this country bunny are going to make it as a police officer. What about all the predators are, that are out there that could eat you up? Well, Judy Hopps went straight to work and did everything in her power to prove that she, in fact, could make it as a cop, that she had the ability to be a police officer, um, that she would belong 
as a police officer in the glamorous city of Zootopia. Now, this film, which I think I've seen a million times with my kids over the years, highlights the ways that I think we often spend so much time and energy trying to fit in, striving to belong, trying to prove that we have a place. I think it speaks to some deeper issues that most of us have um, that in many ways are universal. We all tend to experience them, that at times we can feel unaccepted, unloved, and unable to jump through the countless hoops that we try to jump through in order to prove that we are in fact valuable, that we are lovable. When we don't get the promotion we want, when we don't get the grades we think we've earned, we ask, are we enough? When we feel slighted or offended or made fun of, we may ask, where do we belong? These insecurities and challenges are universal And yet, I think this passage today that we're looking at um, will speak in some ways to these insecurities. So I'd ask that we keep all of this in mind as we look at the passage. So we're going to go ahead and read it, and then I'm going to go back to it. So if you would, um, I don't have the whole passage on the screen together because I changed this at the last minute. But I'm going to read verses 26 through 38, which is a little bit long here. So bear with me. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. Translation's a little different on the screen. I'm going to keep going. Um, First, I want to mention a little bit of background. Doug and his team have been going through this chapter uh, and going through the book of Romans. Romans, of course, was written by Paul. It was a letter written to the church in Rome. Um, It was written to people who already were following Jesus or attempting to. We know from Romans 8 that they were not condemned, that verse that Ron just quoted, 8 verse 1, um, that because of Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection, that we have hope that we are welcomed into the family of God, that through Jesus we have become heirs, inheritors of God's goodness, of his blessings. At this point in the chapter, though, it's clear that the church in Rome was experiencing suffering and hardship, that they were struggling. They know and believe that God is with them, that because of Jesus they have hope, but their reality feels different. Their lived experience feels as though God isn't living up to the promises he's made. And in this context, turn to this passage. The verses I just read, verses 26 and 27, I think reveal something important. A deep, deep connectedness and intimacy with God. A faithful presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. A level of closeness that is so deep that words were unnecessary. The Spirit knows our hearts, and when our suffering, when we're suffering or in need, he knows about them. In this passage, the Spirit's presence is enough. God's presence, what is needed. My mom battled cancer for seven years, almost 20 years ago now. In the last few weeks of her life, when she had already gone on to hospice, I remember just sitting with her. Even though she had been sick for a while, I remember there were so many things that felt unsaid. And there was all of a sudden a sense of urgency that it all should be said. And yet, in those last few weeks, um, she was mostly asleep and largely unaware. And while sitting with her, sometimes I would have the energy to talk as though she was listening. In many moments, I didn't have the energy to talk. There wasn't enough to muster up the strength to actually say anything to her or to even pray. On some level, I felt as though my mom knew all of those unsaid things. In this passage, we see something even more powerful, that the Holy Spirit assures us that he is there and that he is listening on our behalf. He takes our groans when we're at the utter end And we have nothing else to give. And he offers them up to God. 
that in a moment of intimacy when maybe God doesn't feel present and I have nothing to offer, in those moments of despair, of heartache, of loss, a groan may be all we can muster, and yet the Spirit groans on our behalf. As Pastor Chuck Swindoll argued, says, and there's a quote here, fortunately, the Spirit possesses power we do not. At the end of our strength, we groan, and that's it. There's nothing more. The Spirit groans with purpose. He intercedes on our behalf, praying with wisdom we do not possess, requesting for us what we are too short-sighted to perceive. And most important of all, he groans his intercessions in heaven so that our minds and the mind of the Father will unite to accomplish his will. Adding to that, wording it in a slightly different way, Aaron Sherwood says this, this setup in verses 26 and 27 is one where God himself mans all the stations at once to ensure that the divine presence of the Spirit indeed meets the believer's needs. This passage seems to indicate that the reality is we don't have to do anything in those moments. In those terrible, tragic moments of life, the Holy Spirit is present with those of us who call Jesus our Lord. He knows and feels our pain and intercedes on our behalf. The Spirit alone, not our effort, not our eloquent prayers, not our rationale or wisdom, but the Spirit. The Spirit takes our aimless groans and turns it toward the Father. The Spirit communicates our heart, our needs, our pain, and lays it with a loving, holy God who is with us and who is for us. The intimacy and closeness of God transforms us that no longer do we need to fall into the pattern as Pastor Doug described two weeks ago, of try hard, give up. Try hard, give up. Rather, the life of a follower of Jesus is lived in the same way that we receive our salvation. We are saved by grace through faith, and we follow Jesus by grace through faith. We follow Jesus not through our own effort, but by his grace through faith. Confident that he will meet our needs, confident that he will work in and through us and that he will carry us through. When suffering and pain comes, because it will, we can rest knowing that a close and ever-present God is here banning all of the stations on our behalf. It is easy for us to look to our circumstances as an indicator as to whether or not God is with us, rather than to looking to God himself. When our jobs are insecure, when we experience poor health, when we feel unheard or alone, when our marriages are difficult, when we don't know how to parent, it is easy to question whether or not is God is indeed with us, whether he's really there. Some of you know I work uh, as a middle school teacher, and I sort of joke that all day I go and I talk and I talk, and nobody's listening. And then I go home, my kids, who sometimes it feels like, aren't listening. And sometimes, if I'm honest, I pray to God, I feel as though he isn't listening. It can frustrate me, and I can feel sometimes alone in that. The truth is, though, that the Bible is filled with stories of people of faith asking these types of questions. One example is found in Psalm 42, verse 9, which I think will be on the screen, that says, I say to my God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? You see, it seems natural to me that when hardships come or when times are difficult, that we would ask questions about where God is. But this passage in Romans 8 provides us with the confidence that he is indeed there, that he is present, that even in those deep groaning moments, he is faithful to us. Even when we question it, God is still there. He is not a distant God. Our life circumstances will cer certainly lead us to at times feel as though God may not be here. But I fear that that's because we are looking to our circumstances rather than to God himself. God tells us that he is with us. Not only has he told us, but through time and history, 
and many of our own personal testimonies, we know that God indeed has been with us. He has given us Jesus, his son, to die on the cross for us. He has given us his spirit so that we might feel his presence and rest assured knowing that he is in fact here. So looking back to the text in verses 28 through 30, uh, and I should rib uh, Doug some because I think we could preach about five sermons in these three verses alone. But it says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Now, the first thing that I want to say is is that I sometimes think Romans 8.28, which is a verse that many of us know, is often misused, or at least used in ways that might be unhelpful. My mom died, and I remember after she passed away in 2006, well-intentioned people quoting this verse to me, trying to encourage me. But let's be honest, it didn't feel encouraging. I remember thinking, well, my mom's death doesn't feel very good for me, or for her, for that matter, on some levels. Or even today, if I really think about it, 18 years later, I I, you know, it still in some ways doesn't feel good. There's still a sense of loss. My mom never met my wife. My mom never met my children. Um, So there's a challenge on some levels with with this as well. The problem as well is uh, that we're often, again, going back to my point, we're looking at our life circumstances in this because we often make ourselves the center of the story. See, we want this verse to mean, and I think people often say it in a way that indicates that what we really mean or want out of this verse is that we would get everything we want or anything that we, need, that we think we need. I wanted my mom to be cured of cancer, but this verse doesn't promise me that. God never promised us that we would get everything we wanted as though he were a genie in a bottle just ready to grant our wishes. What he promises us is that he is with us and that in the midst of our suffering, he is not far, but he is groaning on our behalf. And even though now, this exact moment may be hard, there is very clearly a future that is brighter that God has already given us and promised us, even if we aren't there yet. Annette Potgeiger words it this way and says about verse 28 that the formula of verse 28 assumes that the audience is aware that divine action equates good results that will follow. In other words, the readers of this letter, the church in Rome, would have known that when God moves, good eventually follows. When God intervenes, blessings eventually flow. We need to zoom out, though. Part of the problem, again, is that we place ourselves at the center of the story, and we have to zoom out to a bigger picture beyond our individual lives. God does indeed work things out for the good of all who love him, but God is working within a specific moment that is a part of a much larger picture, a grander story than we can always see or even comprehend from our small spot in that history, in that story. In this way, if we step above ourselves, God is indeed working things out for the good of those who love him. Think of all that he has done that Romans 1 through 8 has said, those chapters that we've been looking at, God has created everything and made it good. Humankind chose its own way, causing a break in relationship with God, a break in relationship with each other, and a break in, break in relationship with all of creation. In the midst of that deep brokenness of this suffering, of this pain, God sent Jesus, who because of his death and resurrection offers us healing from that brokenness. He welcomes us into his family, present with us. He offers us so much more than the piddly little wishes that I fear we often force onto verse 28. He offers us so much more, but we're willing to settle. On the screen, you're going to see a picture here. 
and it has a bunch of individual photos. Uh, and these individual photos all are moments in people's lives that they've taken photos of, whatever was important to them. And these photos are all important moments. They're not insignificant, although, you know, in the age of iPhones and smartphones where we take a million pictures of everything, our photos may not be as grand and significant as they were 20, 30 years ago. But still, these photos are important moments. That's why people took pictures of them. But we have to, if we take a step out and look at the bigger picture that these are a part of, we see, in the next slide, um, a bigger and different picture. All of those individual photos are part of a mosaic. And those individual photos are important moments. They're not insignificant, but pooled together, they make something more beautiful, right? And if you will, better. In fact, this image is a collection of all of those things put together. And in the moment, we can drown in the moment, in the detail, right? We can drown in the small. Sometimes it's helpful to zoom out the big picture of God's work. In fact, God is with us to the end. He will help us and aid us through it all. God did not begin a work in us, simply abandon us. He is faithful. Now, verses 29 and 30, again, five sermons here, go briefly through. Uh, in fact, um, this verse, as Anne, Annette Potgeiter also says here, the purpose of Romans 8.28 is clarified in Romans 8.29. For the sake of time, I'm only going to focus on a couple of things here because there's just a lot we could talk about. But first thing I want to focus in on is in verse 29 when it says, to be conformed to the image of his son. Image. Image. This is a phrase and concept in the Bible that honestly has really fascinated me a lot in the last couple of years. Um, clearly, in using this phrase, Paul, when writing this to the early church, was pointing us back to the book of Genesis, where God created humankind in his image. Being made in the image of God being transformed into the image of Christ, there's a whole lot packed into this, these words and these phrases. The word image also in scripture talks a lot about idolatry and worshiping of idols, which in the ancient times, of course, was um, pretty pronounced in the worshiping of carved images or, or stones, right? But scripture makes it clear that even good things can become idols, things that we are worshiping or getting our value or worth from other than God. Certainly, in being conformed into the image of Christ, there is a moral dimension that we no longer live as selfish beings focused on ourselves or our own desires, but that we live as Christ did, sacrificially for others. That being said, the image of this word image also speaks to something that I think at times I miss. The word image speaks to belonging. In essence, being made in God's image being conformed into the image of Christ indicates that we belong to him. In Christopher Wright's book, The Mission of God, he describes how ancient kings, as they conquered new territory, would go out to the edge of their kingdoms, at the edge of the empires, and they would put up images of themselves. It was, in essence, a you know, declaration saying to everyone who passed by, this is mine, this belongs to me. In the same way, in the Gospels, when Jesus is asked the question about the coin, he's asked about the, the coin that has Caesar's image on it. And he says to him, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. The image imprinted on that coin is Caesar's. And as a result, it belongs to Caesar. However, the image of God imprinted and imparted to us means that we belong to him. It also points back to earlier passage in Romans where before Jesus, we were slaves to our selfishness and to our sin. But because of Jesus, we have been purchased and redeemed by him, that we have been made his. We belong to God. He is present and with us. The second thing from these verses I want to draw out is in verse 30, and it's the phrase, called. For the early church, 
this phrase would have taken them again back to Genesis, this time Genesis 12, where Abram is called out, called by God, given a name, and given a promise that he would be a blessing to all peoples on earth. Aaron Sherwood words it this way, In biblical and early Jewish theology, and so also in Romans, for God to call means inviting someone into a transformative personal relationship and vocational co-partnership with him. Thus, verses 29 and 30 strongly indicate that because of Christ, we belong to him. He has changed us and is changing us. He has given us a job, a mission, a purpose. We are called to be like him, to be a blessing to those around us. This takes us to the rest of this chapter, which also could be multiple. But in verse 31, it says, What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long and we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am in, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. So I like to say that Paul, um, in this book, he does these step layers, right? And he's constantly layering on top of things, which can make it difficult for us to sort of break down because he's always pointing us back to other things that we've that, were, that already were there, right, in the passage. And in verse 31, this the thing, these things is pointing us back to the entire book of Romans that you've been studying right? People are broken, selfish, and unable to rescue themselves. But, but, God has given us a gift that we don't deserve in Jesus, who offers us healing, restored relationships. God promises to be with us and for us. This passage in many ways is the climax of this chapter, that if we belong to God and Christ is mine, then what obstacles are there? Again, some of you know, I just said a minute ago, I, work, I teach middle school. Uh, and middle schoolers today go through slang a, a lot. It just keeps changing. And uh, teachers, it's really hard to keep up. Or parents, I mean, this constantly is changing. And words change meaning. And most of it in today's world has to do with online stuff, memes and TikTok videos and all sorts of things that, that their slang keeps changing. Well, one word at the moment that my students are using a lot is op. Op, right? And best I can tell, op means opponent, enemy, op, you know, this obstacle. And the way that they use it, it's like, oh, Fatima, she's my op. Or, oh, Mrs. Mumtaz, she's my op. Right? Interestingly, I hear this word op used most in the class about teachers. Right? (laughs) Mr. Winterberg is my op. And usually that means I tried to get them to do schoolwork or I wouldn't let them play games on their Chromebook. You know, horribly cruel. But on their op, right? Verses 31 through 38 
It, they don't tell us that we won't have ops. Opposition will come. Hardship and difficulties will be there. This passage doesn't tell us that because we belong to Jesus that we've escaped the hardship. But it is telling us that through Jesus, we have a power that overcomes. Through Jesus, we have a greater purpose. That through Jesus, we have a greater victory. Through Jesus, we have a greater love. These verses remind us of Jesus' ultimate triumph and victory, that he has conquered death, darkness, that he is over all of the powers of the day, that everything in our world that seems to have an illusion of power, money, influence, control, disease, death, suffering, brokenness, Jesus is over all of it. That through his death, burial, and resurrection, Jesus wins. As his family, as people who belong to Jesus, as people purchased by his blood, we share in his victory. There is nothing that can separate us from belonging to Jesus. Our feelings, when we don't feel loved or valuable, nope, belong to Jesus. Our sufferings, hardships, and difficulties, nope, we belong to Jesus. Our failures, our ugliness, nope, we belong to Jesus. Our insecurities, our shortcomings, we belong to Jesus. So what can we do? We can rest. I think sometimes we too eagerly jump back on the train, again, as Pastor Doug says, try hard, give up. We don't need to prove ourselves to God. He loves us. He groans on our behalf. My failures will not separate me from him. I belong to him. We can draw close to Christ to rely on him. Now, I'm not suggesting that we are passive in our walk with Christ. On the contrary, I believe that we actively draw close to him. We spend time with him. We allow ourselves to be known and to know him. We allow the Holy Spirit to complete his work in and through us, to transform and mold us. I think, though, for me, my default, the way that I flip back in my mind, is to flip back my efforts. To flip back to this idea that I have to measure up that I have to be good enough to keep receiving the love that God freely offered through Christ. I think about the laundry list of things that I'm supposed to do, the hoops I'm supposed to jump through in order to worthy to, be, to belong to God. Just like in Zootopia, where Judy hops, just keeps doing more and more and more in order to prove that she is, belongs as a cop in the big city. Maybe this isn't your struggle, but for me, this passage invites me to step off the hamster wheel and to relish and delight my friend Jesus, who delights in and wants to be close to me. Because tomorrow, I'm going to wake up and I'll have forgotten the grace and goodness of God. Tuesday, wake up again and I'll have forgotten the goodness and the grace of God. We can remove ourselves from the center of the story. Now, this one's hard and one that I think most of us struggle with constantly. But we can trust that God has the bigger picture in his hands, that he will work out his plan and purpose, that the good will eventually come in his time. Now, there's a song that came out a few weeks ago that Rebecca St. James and For King and Country recently released. I'm going to share this part of the song verses up on the screen. Uh, but it says, grant me serenity, Lord, and patience, for things will take time. Grant me freedom to walk a new path, and let me feel your love. In my weakness, you can shine. In your strength, I can fly. You make everything, everything beautiful. Make everything, everything new. Make everything, everything beautiful. And it's time. In your time, it's beautiful. Lifting open hands to you, my Savior, beautify my soul. 
knowing that you redeem my pain and failure, purify my soul, beautify my soul. You see, in his time, as a part of the grand story of God, he is at work. We have the awesome privilege of being invited into that huge story. We aren't the center of it. Lastly, I'd ask that we can live into and live out our calling. We belong to Christ, not just for our own sake, but in that belonging, we have been called to love God, to love others, to invite others into the belonging that this passage describes, to point others to a Jesus who loves this broken and messed up world, speak of a Jesus who has conquered death and darkness and brokenness, to live out the sacrificial love and service of a Savior who gave himself for me, who loved me even when I was openly hostile to him. May we do the same. Let's pray. Most high God, we thank you for your promises. We thank you that you are with us. We thank you for the fact that through Jesus we belong. That there is nothing that can separate us from you and from your love. God, I just pray that as we leave this place, that you would allow us to rest in you. That you would allow us to remove ourselves from the center of the story allow you to be who you are. May we live out the calling that you have called us to, to live sacrificially focused on others. Pray this through your Son and by your Spirit. And the Lord's people said, (laughs) Amen. Yeah, I've had an opportunity to listen to some of Steve's other sermons, and I really like his style. And uh, we're just really blessed to have some good preachers in this church, but really different styles. And thank you for that. Good stuff. So you're going to have a chance to talk to Steve and Shelley at our potluck. And so uh, we're going to have you guys do the normal setup thing, turn the tables around. And, uh, and if you didn't bring anything, I think there's usually enough, so hang out. And we will be keeping you updated on our further conversations with Steve and Shelley. So let's get ready for our time of fellowship and eating.